you know without further ado uh, i would like to invite ma'am on stage because you would really want to hear her career from her own words uh, so first of all it's just a it's a real pleasure to be here so thank you for being so welcoming um, I have to say that your uh, classmate just gave the best reading of my bio that I've ever heard. It really summed up the key points very well. Uh, and I've heard it a lot over the last 10 and a half months. So thank you, that was really very nice. Um, you know, I will give a couple of opening remarks, but I really want to hear from you and see if you have any questions for me. Uh, and then maybe we can have a bit of a conversation. Uh, because I think if I stand here and sort of talk at you, it's a wasted opportunity, really. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, we can always uh, we can always get get to those later, maybe through my colleagues. But but why don't we have we have about 20 25 minutes right now, so I don't want to be the one doing all the talking. All I'll tell you is I hear um, that you are all among the brightest students at this very large university. Uh, this university I've now visit, been visiting uh, for, for uh, since, since we arrived here in the late afternoon, and immediately it's just obvious uh, what a welcoming environment you have here and how dedicated uh, the administrators and, and professors are here. And just, uh, if I can say, there's a certain courtesy I'm observing here where, where learning is obviously respected. There, you know, there's signs to be silent and, and there really is silence. It seems like the kind of place you can think very deeply. So I think, uh, I hope you're enjoying your studies here. Um, but I also know that you in particular um, are very gifted students because you are going to uh, take the civil service exam. Um, and I come from a competitive entry process. To be a U.S. diplomat can be competitive. It, I think it was when I took uh, the exam, it's, it's ultimately there's a written exam and an oral exam. I think one in 200 applicants become a member of the Foreign Service. Since being here in India, I've come to realize that's kind of a large <laughs> ratio compared to the even more competitive uh, atmosphere that, that exists here. So I wish you all the best with that. Um, I'm going to just say a couple of words about the U.S.-India relationship. Um, why am I using part of our valued uh, 20, 25 minutes to talk about the U.S.-India relationship? Because if you are successful, as I hope and trust um, you will be, in becoming an Indian civil servant, I can almost guarantee you t that whether you're at the national level govern of government or the state, local level of government, you will have dealings with the United States. And it, it, it actually um, makes me very happy to say that because from where we sit at the consulate in Hyderabad and we oversee U.S.-India relations with uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh and Odisha, and what we see just here in our own district is 130 American companies just here in Hyderabad. Uh, there are more major companies out in Andhra Pradesh. For example, in uh, Shri City, there's PepsiCo, there's Kellogg's, there's um, so, so we see that. Uh, we see that Indian students are now the number two uh, group of students for foreign students in the United States. That's uh, 166,000 Indian students. That number went up by uh, about 25% uh, in a single year, I think. I mean, it's really extraordinary. And, and the only group of students that's larger than Indian students is Chinese students, um, but the rate of growth in Indian students is, is higher than for China. So it's reasonable to assume that eventually there'll be more Indian students in the United States than anywhere else. So we have the academic relationship. We have, and there are many, many exchanges uh, in addition to students. We have professors, we have Fulbright scholars, there's um, a unique program, the Fulbright Nehru Scholars, Nehru Fulbright Scholars, who, who are chosen to go to the United States, a very, uh, very prestigious program. So that, that, that exists. Um, we have a trade relationship that frankly is too small. 
uh, given the size of our respective countries, but it's growing a lot. So right now, I think it's a, a 1.5 billion, and it, it, and and we hope it will grow even more in the coming years. Uh, so so there's that, and then a lot of this is grounded in uh, cultural uh, relationships. So in Andhra, for example, uh, we understand, and I believe it, one in four people have a family tied to the United States. So, so chances are good, either in your work or with your colleagues, you know, you will uh, be exposed to relations with the United States, which is good, good news. And, you know, I won't, I won't go into all the details, but at a high level, you know, U.S. government, Indian government um, level, there's just tons of things going on. Virtually every ministry has some kind of dialogue with a counterpart ministry in the United States now. Virtually all. So it's on cybersecurity, it's on agricultural issues, it's on just about everything. So again, I say uh, if you're as successful as I, I wish you will be, um, then, then chances are good you'll be working with us and I'm very happy about that and I think things will get uh, even better. So I think I'm gonna stop uh, right there and I would like to uh, invite uh, someone to uh, ask a question or, you know, shall we? Good evening, ma'am. Uh, Hello. This was really great. Uh, since we are talking about the India and US uh, strategic relationship and all that, and we talked about this, uh, the students, a lot of students from India going abroad for, uh, to the United States and for studies and all that. So, how do you see this H-1B visa issue? Yeah, so uh, people, not surprisingly, ask us that all the time. <laughs> so, um, so the first thing is there's a lot of misinformation. There, there is no, uh, there are no planned at this stage. There are no proposed changes to the H-1B system. What has happened is the president asked. Uh, various members of his government to look into the H-1B system and see where it needs, you know, if and where it needs adjusting. So there really are no changes to see it. I, I will note just a couple of things about the H-1B program, um, and some of this is a little tough love. <laughs> so uh, the majority of uh, beneficiaries of the H-1B program have been Indian students, but it's a global program. So changes that are being made, you know, affect global applications. Um, and uh, what the H-1B visa is supposed to be, it's not really a student exchange visa. In other words, it's not designed to help students of any one country work in the United States. What it is meant to do is have uh, companies in the United States be able to recruit talent that they cannot find in the United States. So. Um, it happens to be there are really a tremendous number of talented Indian students, which is why uh, there are so many, you know, Indian students. Um, our companies, you know, value uh, the H-1B program. Um, there have been some companies that have, you know, it's been felt that maybe stretched the program a little bit, that used it to hire people at a lower cost, let's say. I, I want to point out, and this, you know, I arrived in India in October, and uh, the election happened just a couple of weeks after I came. During the campaign, the president the now president, you know, cited an American company for this issue. They were not singling out, you know, any foreign companies for this. So, so that's why the review is happening, and we'll just have to wait and see. The, the only last thing I'll say is if changes to the program do happen, and I say if, you know, it will, it will not happen overnight because most aspects of the program, the number of people who come, you know, the requirements of the program are actually congressionally mandated. So it has to go through our Congress, any, any changes. So we will see changes coming. And so at our consulate, we will see it as our responsibility to make sure that uh, students will be well advised of any changes. Okay, kind of a long answer, but I hope a helpful one. Okay, thank you. Good evening, ma'am. My name okay. is Rayan Sharif. Um, after the tensions between USA and Iran, uh, US government has asked India to reconsider its investment in Iran, especially in Chabahar port. But uh, Chabahar port strategically is very important for India. So how do you look at it? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I confess I am not familiar with that uh, specific case. 
But I think it's important to remember that the, um, the desire to keep Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons was not just a U.S. desire. You know, these were multilateral talks. These are international obligations. In other words, it, Iran made an obligation to the international community. And I think it's a general principle of international relations that when a country makes a commitment, in return for benefits, you have to hold the company to its uh, country to its commitments because otherwise you're really, um, you know, uh, negatively affecting the whole point of international diplomacy. So, so we do take it seriously. Our international counterparts also take it seriously. Um, you know, it's up to each sovereign country to decide, in a way, how it will apply you know, something like that. But we, uh, in the United States and India, you know, we have so many strategic objectives in common, including right here in this region, and we try and support, you know, a lot of your objectives in the region. So yes, we, we regard India now as a partner, and that's how those discussions happen, so that we can help each other reach our security objectives. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Rafi Rahman. United States of America, a very great nation for being the oldest democracy in the world, right? But ma'am, nowadays there are the apprehensions or you may call that mm -hmm. misapprehensions mm -hmm. that United States of America is heading towards divided states of America. Mm -hmm. Divided on the basis of what? Divided on the basis of color, white and black. Divided on the basis of rich and poor. Mm -hmm. Divided on the basis of so-called natives and immigrants. Mm -hmm. India has a large diaspora over there in America. So, uh, keeping this thing in mind, how do, you, how do you see the role of civil society and the other democratic institutions functioning in the United States mm -hmm. to make the United States, States nation great once again? Well, that is a very multifaceted, excellent question. So let me try and pull it apart a little bit. Uh, there are, um, the United States, like India, is a boisterous democracy. And we go through phases, as I believe India goes through phases, of trying to define ourselves and, and what is most important to us. Um, and I think you're right in that there are a lot of divisions in America, but I, I would put it, in addition to being divisions, they're not always necessarily divisions. What they are is differences, you know, so if you live in a major metropolitan area, your view of the world, and you're on the coast, your view of the world will just by, by nature be different from someone who's living in a town in rural Pennsylvania where the only factory closed five years ago and there haven't been a lot of jobs. And I think, I think that would be true in any country. So I think what you're seeing is a lot of dialogue between what is the obligation of a country, a country's government? Is it to uh, provide economic growth? Is it to provide social stability? Uh, and, and because we are democracies, those kind of conversations can't be decided by one person. They have to happen through conversation. I believe, uh, and I really do believe this, most of those conversations still happen in a polite, even if urgent, way. What you see in the newspapers are when, tragically, sometimes the conversation becomes a little out of hand or it take, takes the wrong turn. And we heard, um, you know, for example, uh, the tragic shooting of Srinivas uh, Kuchibotla, for example, we were very aware of, very concerned of. It was condemned by the, pre by the president, by all sorts of local state officials. Um, but of course people are concerned when they see something like that. For the vast majority of people, you know, people of color, uh, minorities, you know, the United States remains a very safe and welcoming place. Um, but unfortunately things happen, and I would argue one case is too many. You know, you can argue, are they really increasing? 
it's a subject of some debate. You know, are these cases really increasing in the United States, or are they getting a little more attention now because of the other because of the other dialogue that's risen up around it? Whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. One case is too many. It's not what the United States stands for. You know, we aspire to be a pluralistic, welcoming country, um, and so. Um, but like any country, we have our moments, and so we're having that debate now. Thank you. For okay. Yeah. Ma'am, good evening. Uh, my question is, ma'am, uh, global warming, climate change, terrorism. These are three uh, important issues which are having a threat on humanity. But the uh, stand of America is always unclear on this because, first mm -hmm. of all, instability on the stand in Paris climate change. What your president says one day, it moves away from the state to the mm -hmm. Second mm -hmm. thing goes back to 1996. Um, uh, com comprehensive convention on international terrorism. This was a com convention introduced by India long before the Twin Towers attack in 2000, September 11. So, um, uh, still there are some uh, issues which America don't accept in that convention. So, um, why is that there is the stand of America is always unclear on these two important issues? Okay. Well, um, let me start with the terrorism one. Um, you know, conventions or something, it's, it's funny, governments may support them or not, and I confess, I'm not really familiar with the details of that convention. I can tell you we're certainly against terrorism. We've been something of a world, the world leader, you know, it, it um, you know, after 9-11, especially, for example, the notion of um, it, it freezing terrorism finance so that, you know, it couldn't be used to fund terrorism um, became a big focus. Uh, we, with your government, we actually cooperate a lot on terrorism. We recently designated, you know, certain terrorists, which I think, um, you know, your government supported. Um, we cooperate, we, we talk about best practices, we, we share information. So I think our support for, you know, against terrorism is, is quite strong, actually. Um, and in terms of uh, global, um, of uh, climate change, the president did withdraw us from the Paris Agreement. You know, um, the Paris Agreement is a non-binding agreement, and he did make the offer, though, to renegotiate some parts, and the international community wasn't that, you're, you're shaking your head, a lot of members of the international community weren't weren't supportive. Um, you know, I think there are still things that we're very focused on that we cooperate on, including uh, with India. So, for example, renewable energy, clean energy, the sort, you know, the kinds of things that will help clean up the air, no matter whether you believe global warming is, you know, man-made or not. These are things, positive things that we're working on together. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, I don't think you'll see a decrease in cooperation. What's also very interesting is on a local level, you know, the um, different policies are emerging on a local level on this issue too. This is again one of these issues in the United States that I think is, is as we tend to do, you know, looked at, um, debated. So we'll see where we are. Is there anything else? You can, uh, India and China, uh, there is a friction going on between these two nations regarding yeah. the Doklam uh, area dispute. So, uh, if this standoff leads to a full-fledged war, what will be the standoff of yes? <laughs> I think I'm just going to deflect that and say <laughs> that we're very hopeful it won't, as I think both India and China are hopeful it will not you know, devolve into a full-fledged conflict. Um, you're much more the experts on this than I am, but I think when you have uh, two powers like this at a brink, there's a general recognition it's really best to walk away from the brink in some ways. So uh, I, I, I am not an expert in this area, but we all see a benefit in a stable world. And as, uh, you know, um, so uh, I'll leave it at that. We, we can't, we, Hope we have told both sides we hope for a peaceful resolution of these issues. So, what if uh, the worst part of this uh, happens? What if what? We are uh, very much optimistic that it doesn't happen. Right. What if the worst part happens? Yeah, I can't really an I can't really answer that because so much would depend on um, what is really happening. I just am here to tell you I'm. I, I'm fairly confident it won't, and hopeful it won't. But it's but it is an issue for India and China to to resolve. Not every problem actually <laughs> lies at the United States door. <laughs> so.
Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Hello. My name is Kushi. Hi. Uh, my question is, when it comes to bilateral relationship like between India, India and US, so the path looks familiar. But if there is a conflict like between uh, US and North Korea, then what would India's role be in that situation? And on the other hand, if uh, if there's an issue between India and its neighbors in, you know, in the subcontinent, then what would the US's role be mm -hmm. in that issue? Because again, I think this is again, you know, it's very hard for me to look in a crystal ball and say what would be the response of the United States, what would be. I can only tell you what is right now uh, the, the view. So regarding North Korea, uh, this is another one of these cases, like a couple of these cases that we talked about where you have an irresponsible international player um, shooting missiles, you know, th making threats. Just basically, you know, for us, the threats are directed at us, but actually you have to remember the neighborhood in which North Korea lives. Have, have you looked at the map of North and South Korea and you realize how close Seoul is? Um, and then Tokyo, you know, so it's really destabilizing to the whole region. And I, I think it's really no exaggeration to say there, there isn't a country an, on earth that would really benefit from an open conflict that North Korea would cause. So again, you know, it's, a, it's UN mandates, you know, and sanctions, it's the international consensus. So I think India's role, we would see as being also, you know, a full member of the international community to, to condemn these kinds of threats, these destabilizing actions. It's kind of, for lack of a better word, totally irrational behavior on the point of view, you know, part of view. So, you know, and, and, and the other thing about North Korea that we really regret is um, how they're failing their own people. So they're spending all their time threatening their neighbors, threatening us, and yet, you know, there, there's threats of famine all the time. There's a total lock hold on the exchange. You know, you're the largest democracy, we're the oldest democracy. Total lack of uh, open communication in North Korea. Total lack of, um, you know, an ability for people to get outside information. So it's, it's just a very unfortunate, tragic situation. Um, and it really is important for the international community to stick together on this. Thanks. I think you need. To this is the last Now that's, that's a good question that I can't really answer with statistics except to say that I've also been told that one in four uh, Silicon Valley workers is from India. So I'm not, that one I've even had the vice president of Salesforce, which is a very major software company, who's fr he's actually from Warangal. Uh, he told me he was a little suspicious of that. But whatever it is, the contribution is actually very large. And in fact, the Telugu, uh, you know, the, this area's contribution is very large. I will only say, uh, obviously, American companies think the potential here uh, is very important because Microsoft has its biggest campus anywhere in the world outside the United States here. Google is building its largest campus anywhere outside the world here. We have Apple, we have Amazon. Uh, you know, I mentioned those 130 companies. A lot of them are major uh, companies. By the way, did you realize the CEOs of Microsoft and Adobe are both Hydro bodies, which we always promote. So I, this is actually a good opportunity for me to quickly tout the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. So have you all heard about this? Okay, so obviously it's a recognition. It will bring together uh, 1,500 um, entrepreneurs from around the world, plus investors, plus mentors, plus speakers, um, and 400 from India. It's an, it's an invitation only event. 400 from India, 400 from the United States, 400 international. So there was a recognition Hyderabad competed with I think six other five other localities and one so I think we're and we left it to India but we were delighted that Hyderabad was chosen because we do think of it as an important center so okay I think do I have time for the one more okay yeah okay okay Okay. 
Columbia, actually, you know, I, I, I should have read in detail the whole thing, but the president announced a major initiative and actually was, what was said about Pakistan, both by him, by him and the Secretary of State, seemed to have made the government of Pakistan <laughs> a little unhappy. So I think, I think it did deal with uh, the role of Pakistan. Certainly, I did serve in Afghanistan also, and the role of India. Uh, at the time even, which was 2009 to 2010, India's role in helping to uh, help Afghanistan build up its economy was very, very appreciated, particularly uh, in help for women. Uh, there were some, you know, not necessarily expensive programs of assistance, but very effective programs. So Afghans have a real appreciation for India's role in their country. And so do we. So thank you. Okay, thank you.